Well, as you figured out by now, it's Mission Sunday. We have once a quarter to uh, keep different projects and missions before you, to think about missions and be involved one way or another. Our speaker today is Mike Klontz. He's with New Tribes Mission, which is a good outfit. Uh, when I was in my late teens or early 20s, living in Southern California, a fellow from New Tribes came and uh, presented his work, and that planted a seed in me. A few years later, I went off to Bible school and uh, met Miriam, which is the same thing Mike did. He went to uh, Prairie and met Gwen there, and uh, also Ed Matfeld. They were there some overlapping years. Um, that fellow that uh, spoke to me, we still exchange emails occasionally. His name is Dwayne Staus. And uh, both of us have a similar ministry today of counseling Hispanics around the world, new believers, through the Internet. He's a good guy. It's a good mission. Uh, Mike and Gwen served in Bolivia for years, and then recent years came back to the States to uh, be representatives of their mission, to let people know about the work, and to, I use the word recruit. Our mission doesn't like that word because it seems too crass, but that's what we do. <laughs> Uh, we met eight years ago at a missions conference, and every missions conference I've attended, uh, since then I've bumped into him. He goes to everything. He's a hard worker. And uh, one semester we were colleagues. He teaches missions at uh, Moody Bible Institute downtown. And a couple of years ago, they enrolled too many kids for their teachers, and uh, I offered to help out, so I got to teach along with them. He's a good guy, and uh, looking forward to what he has to share with us today. Uh, actually, they attend here, but uh, you may not have seen them much because they're all over the place. Last Sunday, they were in Canada. They traveled all over with conferences. So, Mike, come on up. The time is yours. Gwen, if you want to stand just for a second so everybody can see. Oh, yeah, that's who. That's who it is. If you can imagine entire, not just villages, but entire language groups, over 2,000 of them, still without one copy of God's Word in their heart language. They're still waiting to hear, waiting for someone to go and tell them, and that is our heartbeat. That is our thrust. That is our passion, is to see those people have a chance to hear. My name is Mike Klontz. This is my wife, Gwen. We've served with uh, a mission organization named New Tribes Mission for, well, since shortly after we were married, about 40 years ago. New Tribes Mission works among unreached people groups in most uh, every continent around the world. Our goal as a mission is to take the message of God's Word to people who have never had a chance to hear it, those unreached people groups, and especially to be involved uh, in seeing churches established right in their midst. Think of one group way out in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, very inaccessible. Three days hike or a very expensive helicopter trip, the only ways to get in there where some of our missionaries have gone. But you know, after the gospel was presented years ago to these dear people, one, and they responded to the message, one dear man, came up to the missionaries and he said, I have a question for you. He said, did your father know this message? He said, yes. He said, well, did, your, did his father know this message? And he said, yes. And, and his father, would he have had access to this message? Yes. Then he looked at the missionary and he said, how come it's taken us so long to hear it? Okay, now we're on. Great. Well, and you're going to have to turn me down because I tend to speak with a little bit louder voice than the average person, and partly that's because we don't get the, the luxury of using a microphone when we're in the classroom, and so you just learn to, to speak loud, trying to keep students awake sometimes, especially when you teach right afternoon. But 
the video talks about uh, the work of New Tribes Mission. And uh, as a mission, we work in pretty well every continent around the world, uh, over 30 countries, most of those, uh, many of those in church planting among unreached people groups with over 3,000 missionaries that have gone really to the far-flung corners of the world. Gwen and I were privileged to go, as Jerry's already uh, very adequately introduced us, uh, stole some of my thunder here, but that's okay. Uh, and you're going to be able to look at the back table there and pick up a little bit more information either about New Tribes Mission or about us in particular. But uh, we served down in Bolivia, South America for 15 years with our four children. When we went to the mission field, our oldest was five, and we had a three-year-old, and we had five-month-old twins. Well, you can imagine, we could have been busy just uh, taking care of our own family a week after we got there. Well, no, I'm going to save that for a little bit later here. But let me just say we served in a variety of ministries there on, on the mission field. And uh, now uh, we've just been thrilled to, as we return from the field, to serve as, uh, like Jerry said, not really recruiters. That's what the military uses, that term. We uh, are representatives for New Tribes Mission we are able to travel to around the Northwest to churches, colleges, camps, and conferences, and to share the challenge of what God is doing on the mission fields of the world today and how he can use us to be a part of that. And so that's, uh, that's what takes us uh, a lot of times uh, in our travels to other places when we, we can't be here. Uh, we've taken short-term uh, teams down to Venezuela a number of years ago and then more frequently and recently to Mexico where we have a national training center, and we've been able to do projects there. And I'm thrilled to see this group that was up here a little bit ago uh, getting ready to, to go. Praise the Lord. You know, when I've asked in our missions classes, how many have gone on short-term mission trips? And so many of the students have raised their hands. And then I've asked them, either individually or collectively as a group, did you see things a little differently when you came back than before you went? And of course, the response is always yes because it can be a real life-changing experience. And there at Moody Spokane, even privileged to have, like pastor's daughter, Emily, uh, was there in the class here two or three years ago. Um, uh, it's hard to remember with about 60 students uh, coming through every semester in every, any uh, given class. But um, it is a privilege to be here with you today, and we enjoy uh, our fellowship with you, getting to know your names as we've been able to, uh, and uh, we'll... Uh, we can't always be here the next two Sundays. Uh, we'll be, we're privileged to be a part of a commissioning service of a young couple heading out to Mexico with their family for the very first time. Bible translators, uh, they're going to go down and learn the language of a people group that doesn't yet have God's word in their language, right? Neighboring Mexico, if you can believe that. Still many unreached people groups there. So they're going to go down there and be involved in that church planting effort and so they have there's two of their supporting churches up north that uh, are going to have do commissioning services for them. So that's where we'll be the next, uh, the next two Sundays. However, did we get to where we are today? And sometimes I've, I've wondered, you know, who am I and how did I get here? Uh, where did this process begin? Well, just by way of background, before we get into the message and the word that you see the outline there in the bulletin, we uh, both grew up in pastor's families, Gwen in western Canada and me here in the northwest, specifically in eastern Washington. Uh, the last uh, main years before I went off to Bible college was, was there in Sprague, the town that if you're on the freeway between here and Ritzville, if you blink, you'll miss it, except for the Sprague Lake where I could tell you a lot of stories about experiences there and I won't take the time this morning. But in preparation, for serving the Lord because both of us at an early age had recognized that God had a purpose for our lives and wanted us to serve him, we uh, went up to Bible college to prepare ourselves for that. And that is where we uh, were able to, uh, well, we met each other there. Uh, also met uh, some dear folks like Ed and Patty, Matt Feld, and, and, uh, and many others, some that are here in this Spokane area. And uh, so, uh, and then, of course, after that time, we were able to... Uh, to uh, get married, go on to the New Tribes Mission training program and head down to the mission field of Bolivia after heading for years to Brazil and not getting visas. We tried to unlearn our Portuguese and uh, study Spanish instead. And, uh, and so there we were there serving the Lord until we, we came back to work on uh, the mission from, from this end of things. 
the pa- this past couple weeks, and I'm not sure exactly what's got me thinking along this line, but I've been reflecting on the privilege it is to serve the Lord and the joy it is to serve Him. That joy that comes uh, even when it hasn't always been easy. When you look back, uh, things that uh, we've gone through. Remember back to our first year on the mission field. Um, not only uh, were we uh, blessed with our own four preschoolers as we went to the mission field, but uh, a week after we arrived, we ended up with 13 fifth to eighth grade boys in our dorm home that we took care of. That's a bigger family than even the Hayek's. Um, <laughs> you know? So, uh, sorry, Jeremy. It's, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to offend you there. Um, but uh, we had, and there they were in our care and, and, and taking care of them and, and ministering there at the mission school. Uh, we were barely there a couple months and all of us in our family, the six, six of us came down with typhoid fever. And uh, the Lord saw us through that. Uh, then in the middle of the night, when there's no power at the school, when you're out in a rural location, our dorm home flooded. Water came in. We knew it was raining, but we didn't know until our daughter knocked on our door and said, Mommy, my feet are wet. And we had no clue that our whole dorm home had flooded in there, and that caused its own uh, set of challenges. Uh, A month or two after that, four of us in our family had to take the painful series of rabies shots uh, because of taking care of a dog that uh, was discovered to have had rabies and it died. Uh, And I could go on and on. We had more trips out to the city for medical and other needs that first year than most people ever have in the whole term on the field. And some people say, why didn't you, wasn't that a sign? You know, shouldn't you have (laughs) considered going back home? But you know, we had an unmistakable confidence in the God who had sent us there. And we truly believed that he knew what he was doing. I mean, some people, when we've come back from the field, they said, when you left with those four preschoolers, we thought you were crazy. But you know, we were just doing what the Lord had put on our hearts. And we did it. And we knew that he was the one that was going to take care of us. You see, joy does not come based on circumstances, but because of him being where he wants us and sticking close to him during, and doing what he wants us to do. Think of those verses in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Even though the fig tree may not blossom, and I really should change this now that we work to get this going. Hopefully it's going to work. Um, and sorry, I made mine the wrong dimension, uh, so you'll have to put up with the slides if they're not quite, no, oh, maybe they're okay. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 says, Even though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Sometimes it's easy to say, but it's a little more difficult when things happen, like in our 12th year on the mission field, when our oldest son, at then at the age of 17, fell from a waterfall, 100 to 150 feet, fell, and unbelievably, miraculously, God spared his life. Five major surgeries, coming back to Spokane, recuperation. And we praise the Lord. He's with us today. He and his beautiful wife and four children, uh, four of our (coughs) growing family. We look way too young to have 14 grandchildren. But, um, you know, God uh, has blessed us. uh, and, uh, And that's a whole story in itself. We could talk about what God did in our lives and the life of our son uh, for a long time. We won't take time this morning. Two of our church children have served on the mission field and and um, I just want to say uh, that song, In Christ Alone. Wow, that was the background for one of our kids' presentations when they came back. So every time we hear that, we either want to sing it to the top of our voice, and I was trying to protect my voice because I've got to preach twice today, but uh, it uh, also, or, or it just makes us weep because we recognize, you know, what God has done because we've given of ourselves to see our kids go over there to the mission field. So our daughter was there for five years. Now our son and his wife and four of our grandchildren have been over there in northeast Italy in the church planning ministry, and God has used them. They're actually headed back this way now because of meeting some needs of their eight-year-old son, some health needs that their eight-year-old has. Um, And you know, even though it's difficult to see some of your family go off to the mission field, sometimes it's children, sometimes it's the parents who go, 
But yet it's a joy because you know they are where God wants them. And we wouldn't want anything else. Because we, we just pray, Lord, if they're going to be over there and away from all the family, then you make it worth their while. And let's pray with them for fruit for their labors. And you know, God loves to answer those prayers. Like the Apostle John says in 3 John, verse 4, he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And, uh, you know, as you read through the Old Testament, you know, the, the word joy or joyful, joyous appears almost hundreds of times, even in the Old Testament. But every time it appears, it's because the children of Israel or, or God's people were reflecting on God, who he is, what he's done for them, and uh, all of his many blessings, his power, his protection, his provision, all of those things. And that is what gave them joy. So I thought about what gives us joy today. And obviously, close relationships is one thing. Uh, we, uh, we get married, and uh, we have children, and our joy even increases that much more, and grandchildren, like I mentioned. Um, seeing some of the ones that even that we have challenged, for us personally, that have gone out to the mission field. And uh, just since even we've come back from the mission field, to be able to interact with them. Most of these that you see here on, um, on the slide there, most of those have gone, they've gone to countries, have gone or are getting ready to go. The, the couple right here is the one that will be commissioned to go out uh, and they're leaving just in about three weeks to head down to, to Mexico. I'll tell you a little bit more about this couple right there here in a minute. But um, then there's a few others and they've gone to uh, countries like uh, Mozambique and Tanzania to uh, some as school teachers, some as pilots, and for some reason the clicker isn't working this morning, and I'm sorry that I didn't uh, come prepared to have somebody else do the clicking for me, but there you get an idea of some of those uh, folks who have said yes to the Lord, and we've been at just a small part, the link in that chain, to see them get to where God wants them to go, um, really in every continent. Papua New Guinea, um, Russia, um, and we could go on and on uh, where, where some of them... Uh, are, are headed uh, even these days. I think of that couple I just showed you, Ryan and April Beck, and uh, I might need help clicking it if this doesn't, I think it was work now? Okay, let's see how this does. It's not quite, um, there, um, nope, going the wrong way, there. One more forward. I might need your help to do that. If I go like this, you'll know I want to change. <laughs> I'll just raise my hand, and then you'll know. Uh, Ryan and April Beck. And, uh, you know, one, one of them from Vancouver, Washington, one from the Tri-Cities. Now they're over in Asia Pacific serving. They've been, they're already a term in the field. They're back there for the second term, and right now have just gone in to start a brand new work with the Tudu people there. So they will go in, they will learn the language of those people, they'll live amongst them, they're building their house right now, but they will um, actually live with those people, learn their language, be able to go through the process to reduce it to writing, and then, of course, begin the ministry of translating God's word into the heart language of those people as they then will begin teaching them. First, teaching them to read and write their own language, we call it literacy, and then because they'll, they'll, they'll then be readers, they will be able to uh, read what the missionaries are translating when they translate those portions of, of God's Word. And so that is, uh, that's, those are things that, uh, that excite us, obviously. But uh, there are many things that bring us joy. Of course, the most important, we would all say, is our salvation. That's really also another relationship, isn't it? It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the one who did it all to make it possible. We have also his word that uh, the prophet Jeremiah said, your word is the joy and rejoicing of my heart. It's God speaking to us, his message to us as his children. And then, we, of course, we have his presence. His presence, which is Psalm uh, 1611. The psalmist David said, in your presence is fullness 
of joy. We have all these things that give us joy. And yet, like any relationship that we have where eventually you kind of want to please the other person, um, rather than just what gives me joy, what I want to talk about this morning is what gives God joy? What brings God joy? And there you see God's delight in creating us for himself. He created us because he wanted to. He did it for his pleasure, for his glory, so we'd have fellowship with him. Those verses, Isaiah 43, um, that's uh, right here on this next slide. There you see. But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Um, whom I have created for my glory, whom I formed and made, this people I have formed for myself. I don't know about you if you ever make something, but if you make something, you feel a little bit of pride of ownership towards that. You might not want somebody to break it, at least not right away. And um, so you, you feel you take ownership of that, and that's what the Lord does with us as his creation. Because if he's created us, obviously he loves us and he wants us for himself. He created us for a purpose. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Then you go clear back to the last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And it reminds us, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will, and some translations will even turn that by your, your pleasure, they uh, exist and were created. You see, he's always wanted that personal relationship with us as his creation. As a mission, the New Tribes mission, we work primarily with animistic tribal people groups. And as we work with them, we come to realize that when we go to them and say, we have a message from God, they, like maybe many people here and in other places around the world, there is a real confusion as to who that God really is. When our missionaries in Bolivia went to the Simba Guarani people of southern Bolivia and said a number of years ago, we want to teach you about God, and they said, well, that's really good because we've heard that name, but we don't know whether God is a fox or a frog or the spirit of our deceased ancestor. Real confusion. Some people think God might be the name of the guy upriver or the name they might put on some supreme being might not be the name of the one that you want to refer to as your God because he may not have those same attributes, those same characteristics as we know the God of the Bible does for us. And so it's so important right at the beginning to establish who God is. They have no idea even how we got here on this earth. Matter of fact, one of our missionaries uh, showed the group of people that he was ministering to early on, showed them a little chart, a diagram of how some people in this country feel that man evolved. And they say, some people believe man evolved from this ape-like creature. And they look at that picture and they say, oh, they're stupid. <laughs> Those are their words, not mine. But, uh, you know, some people think, some tribal groups actually believe that we're either the offspring of the sun and the moon or of two giant birds. They don't know. Because if they don't have their language and writing and they don't have God's word, how would they ever know? Uh, and uh, think of one group, the Acolet people. I have a slide of them a little bit later on in the message. But the Acolet people, uh, just after the missionaries had been there for a few years, were all ready to begin teaching. But they had one big problem. They were going to teach God's word, and they'd already started the translation process, but they couldn't come up with an appropriate word for God. It's really hard to teach about God without an appropriate word for God, isn't it? One day, the missionary was listening when a group of the men were talking amongst themselves, and it was kind of like just off the cuff. They, would, they said something, and of course, they said something, well, of course, we know you can't make something out of nothing. And his ears perked up, and uh, 
He said, uh, excuse me, could you repeat that? Of course, it was in their language. He said, could you repeat what you just said? And he, they said it again. And he went back to his wife and his co-workers, and he said, I think this is it. And so they came up with the name that we want to teach you about the God who can make something out of nothing. And that's what they did, the creator God. And uh, what a joy for those people to learn the truth that they have now, having responded to the gospel, is, uh, is just amazing. Well, uh, not only do we see um, that uh, God's delight in creating us, but then we see his provision for us, God's death on the cross. Let me just say, I appreciate you, Doug, and the worship team, the emphasis you've had this morning on what he did for us on the cross, because he did it all. He did it all for us. There's really nothing that we can do, nothing left to do, or would minimize what he did for us all. Uh, I love what Hebrews 12, verse 2 says. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, lost my place here, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before him. And of course we know that was to finish the work that his father had sent him to do. We know that it was to, to be and do everything that his father wanted him to do. But that joy also included us. You see, Jesus didn't just die on the cross for nothing. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins and your sins and the sins of the entire world. That was the joy. That was the redeeming value in his death on the cross and, of course, then his, his burial and resurrection. He sacrificed so that we wouldn't have to die, so that we could have freedom from sin and new life in Christ, so that we could have his joy in us. As you read there in John 15, that he says, my joy might be fulfilled in you that personal relationship with him. We work amongst some people in uh, remote places like Papua New Guinea and Asia Pacific, other places around the world where they have some very interesting names. And uh, I kind of remember what's happening in those various groups because of people that we've had a part in their lives in many times. Some of the ones you saw there and, and quite a few others that we've uh, known because of knowing their parents and now the missionary kids have gone out as missionaries themselves to some of these tribes, and I could give you Yembi Yembi was one I always like to say, but then they said, well, actually, that's the name of the people, the places, or that was a place, and the people was Inanbimali, and, and uh, I, I, I mean, I could think of so many that would probably make you smile, but one of the groups that we just heard about uh, recently, the Pat Patar group, just heard the gospel message for the very first time, this particular group. In New Tribes Mission, about every 45 days, about every month and a half average, a new language group or a language group that we've had missionaries that have gone to hears the gospel in their own heart language for the very first time and, uh, and gets to hear that teaching. And so as the Pat Patar people heard this uh, message, one of the men said this. He said, I knew that Jesus had died on the cross. This man, his name was Stanley. They often take uh, names of people in the cultures around them, even in Papua New Guinea. And so Stanley was his name, and he said, uh, he was telling the missionary, he said, I knew Jesus had died on the cross, but I just never knew the reason. I had been told that Jesus was the road, but that road of Jesus' work, so I could go to God, was not clear. Now that I understand, I can no longer believe in rituals. It's not my works, but the death of Jesus, his death and resurrection. I believe in his road only. Folks, we got some new brothers and sisters in Christ among the Pat Patar people because missionaries have gone and taken the message to them. And of course, you can imagine, there's joy in the hearts of those Pat Patar people, and in the missionaries have gone to them, but there's really joy in God's heart. Just as the passage that uh, we want to look at uh, together in uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I just want to read those verses. I appreciate they're already on the web, and I didn't put them here on the, the PowerPoint, but uh, in Luke chapter 15, I'll read them briefly, uh, beginning with verse 4. 
What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And then the next, the parable of the lost coin. Or what, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a, a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully till she finds it? When she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. So we know that today there's joy in heaven. If you're here today and you know the Lord Jesus, there's joy in heaven. And it began right, well, probably back when he died for us, but uh, because we know he knows all things. But boy, when you made that decision to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, don't you think, besides the joy that may have come into your heart, that there was joy in his heart? Imagine entire villages then that would turn to Christ when they heard this message and responded to it. Wow, that, uh, really, uh, that really brings joy to God's heart. And then uh, thirdly, we want to see God's desire for all to come to him. And uh, we, uh, I guess I got ahead of myself, that was the scripture that we just, we just read there in, in Luke uh, chapter 15. In a few chapters later, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And many other scriptures that uh, would reiterate that as well. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Just like a shepherd that would have a hundred sheep and lose one, God is concerned about every one of his creation. He would want every one to, to know him as their personal Savior. I think every author of the books of our New Testament probably have reiterated that one way or the other in their letters or epistles, the books there. Think of uh, Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, 9. He says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 3 and 4, he said, not, he said uh, God, he's talking about God our Savior, said, God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then uh, John, the Apostle John there in chapter 6 talks about uh, the bread of God. It says, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We all know verses like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. You know, who is there in the world today that is not encompassed by that term, the world? That's pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? And so uh, we know that he loves the world and he has died for uh, the world as well. God rejoices when sinners turn to Christ. I appreciated the thought from the Daily Bread yesterday. It said this, Jesus longs for our fellowship even more than we long for his. And if you have experienced those precious times of intimate communion with the Lord, you know that he joys them much more than we even could because he sees he's the one who created us. He's responsible for it all. We sometimes try to take things into our own hand and forget where we came from, tell God the thing or two, don't we? But really, we're his because he's the one who created us and then he, he bought us back. Well, then we see God's design for completing the body of Christ as well. And I, I can't help but uh, turn to those verses in Romans chapter 10 that I'm sure you've heard or had somebody preach before or mentioned at a missions conference. Romans chapter 10, it begins at verse 13, says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then it goes on and says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
we know that if others are going to believe, they have to first hear. In order for people to hear, somebody has to go and, and tell them. You know, and I'm sure you've heard preached the, all the references to the Great Commission at the end of all of the Gospels and at the first chapter of the book of Acts. You know that Jesus' last words, that someone said Jesus' last words ought to be our first concern. But apart from just obedience, and this is where I began thinking about this this last week, this whole thing of joy. Why wouldn't I want to share with others what Jesus Christ means to me? Because truly, I have a joyful heart for all that he has made possible, all that he has done for, for me. In the missions class, I have the students turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, you may or may not want to do that now, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you start in verse 9 and read to verse 20, which we're not going to do this morning, but you will find that there are many different, maybe 10 or 15, 20 different motivations for missions right there in those verses. And so I turn the students loose to see how many they can come up with. But the one that really stands out to me, one of the main ones is in verse 14, and it says the love of Christ constrains or compels us to go. That's both his love in us and his love shining out through, through us uh, to, to others. The love of Christ compels us. It's not just obedience. If Gwen and I would have gone to the mission field just because we, we thought God said, you go, and we went there, and if that would have been the only motivation, when those tough times came, we might have believed that we could have heard God telling us something different. But we went because we knew that if we didn't go, there would be people who wouldn't hear. And that was the challenge that we, fa we faced. When you think about so many that are still unreached with the gospel, if you can imagine, there are still, uh, out of the languages in the world, now, most of us can count on the fingers of two hands, well, hands and feet, uh, how many languages we can spout off the names of, but they, we are told there are over 6,900 different languages in the world. So some of you linguists, get started. <laughs> um, that's a lot of languages. And the tragedy is that there are as still as many as 2,000 of them that don't have one copy of God's word in their own heart language. Their Bible would look like this today. Whoops, not that one, this one, sorry. Totally blank. Nothing's been written on the pages because they're still waiting for somebody to come. Over 2,000 language groups that still haven't heard, don't have a copy of God's word in their language. I was thinking of uh, the Chimani people. The Chimani people, they're in Bolivia. We were personal friends with uh, the missionaries there that uh, did the translation of the Chimani New Testament. And at the dedication... Although we weren't privileged to be there personally, we got the story of when one of the Chimani believers stood up at the dedication, the first time he was holding the completed New Testament with some Old Testament portions in it, in his hand, he got up and he said this. He picked up the missionary's English Bible, and he said, you know, this Bible, it's in English. This was, of course, all in his own language he was saying this. He said, this isn't worth very much to us because we can't understand it. That's from the missionary picked up a Spanish Bible, and he said, said, this, oh, it's worth a little bit to us because some of us understand a few words of Spanish, and, and that's okay. But then he picked this up and he held it to his heart. He said, this means everything to us because it speaks to our hearts. What a privilege it is to be part of taking God's word to people in their own heart language that might that never otherwise have a chance to hear. You know, why has God left us here on this earth. I think of those accolade people that today uh, now have responded to the gospel. Yeah, those ones that the missionary was looking for the name for God, and he came up with the one who can create something out of nothing. They now know the Lord. And uh, I just was thrilled to hear a testimony that came out from them. The missionaries that are working with them had to go to another village uh, recently and the story had come that in that other village that uh, there was a couple, young couple, that had just lost a child by drowning. 
And so the believers that were in this tribe, and actually it was a different language group, but they got the message, and so the missionaries were going over to visit there. And the believers in the Acolyte tribe took up a collection, not of money, but of like sweet potatoes and things that they had out there, bananas, sugar cane, taro, taro root, so forth. They took those and they said, here, we want you to take this over to those people and encourage them because they're, they're hurting right now. Folks, that's the difference Jesus can make in hearts and lives of some pretty rough tribal people out there in the midst of the jungle um, because missionaries went and because uh, they shared that message. I think of uh, what brings joy to God's heart. And uh, I love to go to this passage in Revelation chapter 5. And just in closing, Revelation chapter 5. I don't know how many of you like to put together jigsaw puzzles. Occasionally, Gwen and I have done that if we've been somewhere, um, away, usually away from home, and we've got a few days there, and we've been doing some reading and other things, and we have at the thrift store and pick up a jigsaw puzzle. We will never pick up one that doesn't have a picture on the front, uh, like a, a picture of what it's going to look like, the completed picture, you know, the picture on the front of the box. I should take a show of hands. How many of you have ever put together a, a puzzle and never looked at the picture on the front of the box? Why do we do that? Because we want to know what it, the finished product looks like. We want to know. It gives us direction, helps us know what, what we're doing right or wrong or how, where we should proceed. And that's what Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 does. It says this, because this is that time when we're standing around the throne of God in heaven. And it said this. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And we could keep going there. Verse 9, verse 9 tells us, we've been redeemed out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. Tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That pretty well includes everybody. And that means it looks like there is still a job to be done. There is still a tremendous need on the mission field today around the world. Otherwise, why would God have left us here on this earth? Isaiah chapter 43 that we started with a little bit ago makes it real clear when you look at verses 10 and 12 and the end of the chapter. Verse 10 says, You are my witnesses, he told his people. And uh, again in verse 12, Therefore you are my witnesses. In verse 21, This people I formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. And we've been privileged to be here together as a body, as a group this morning, and we've sung God's praises inside the church, but he wants us also to sing his praises in our hearts outside the walls of this church so that we can see people come to know the Lord Jesus, whether it's our next door neighbor, whether it's our family and distant relatives, and those people, as Acts 1-8 reminds us, to the uttermost ends of the earth. And so uh, he, there's still a job to be done. I appreciated what uh, Oswald Smith said. He said, you know, we talk about the second coming. At the same time, half the world has not heard of his first. Uh, Carl Henry said this way, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. And um, some of you will say, well, what, what could I ever do? Um, well, I just got an email or a, a, just an update, and sometimes it all melds together between Facebook and, and email and the New Transmission website and the stories, but this was a particular blog that was posted. And do you know that in the next week or two, the teaching, the evangel evangelistic Bible lesson teaching is going to begin for the very first time in the history of the world. 
in the language group of the Powell people. Everybody, you can, re you can all remember the name of the Powell people. You know, my buddy, my pal, P-A-L. That's an easy name. The teaching is going to begin. These people have never heard the teaching. So the missionary has been preparing the Bible lessons, getting them ready to teach, and we happen to be able, because of you know, all of the web access and everything today, we can actually be aware of that. Years ago, we heard about it after the fact. Well, they're getting ready. And so to build anticipation, to build hype for this event, the missionary has visited a couple, two or three different villages. And as he's gone, he has taken his string of 6,000 beads with him. So that's a lot of beads. Yeah, makes a long string. 6,000. You say, why 6,000? Well, it's kind of to represent, you know, 2,000 years uh, since Christ and 4,000 years before. And so he takes them, these beads, and he, he asks them, okay, he tells them, each bead represents a year. How many years do you remember? And they can remember up to their parents and grandparents, maybe their names of their great-grandparents. So he counts off about 200 beads. They think that's about as far back as it goes. And then he shows the rest of the chain. He says, we want to tell you what happened way back in the beginning, the message from God, way back in the beginning where those, that chain of beads starts. Start building anticipation. And so they're going to be hearing the, the gospel. Sometimes those missionaries get to preach the word twice a day, five days a week. If the people stop their harvesting because they want to hear the message, they want it. Um, wow, what an exciting uh, place to be. And we get to be part of it by praying, by standing behind those who are going, like we've seen this team here this morning, and, and then by being aware of the fact that there are still people out there that haven't heard. And so just as we close, I want to do a little demonstration, and I'm going to need one volunteer. Doug, you're here close. You want to come up here. Um, I'm going to do that just before we close in prayer. And I need you to stand with me right over here. Uh, no, right there. That would be great. And you just stand still, and I'll do the moving. You might want to back up one step. This is a chart. You saw it in the video that I had there, but it's a chart of the unreached people groups of the language of the languages of the world that still are yet to be reached. And it's an alphabetical order from like Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And it just gives you an idea, because we don't every day count to 2,000. And I thought it'd be good to just show you how many different groups there are that are still waiting for that copy of God's word in their heart language. So you think there's still a job to be done? Wow. Maybe we can just leave this right here for a minute. And uh, if we don't cover up that mic too far, maybe. Um, and uh, we'll just close in prayer, and then maybe if somebody wants to look at that afterwards, we can, yeah, closing song, right, yeah. So let's just uh, have prayer, and then we'll uh, turn it over to the worship team. Lord, we thank you for the missionaries who have gone to these far-flung corners of the world. Thank you for being able to be a part of it, and even here as a body here at Valley Bible Church for their part in seeing a lost world reach for you. We know that's very much on your heart. We know that there's so much joy in your heart when even one sinner turns to you, uh, let alone entire villages or, um, Lord, people groups from around the world. And so we pray that just as you've told us to there in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, to pray you as the Lord of the harvest that you will send forth laborers to your harvest fields. And if you want to use some of us in this church this morning, we pray that you would do that as well. We pray that we would stand behind those missionaries who are going to the Powell people, their... Uh, and uh, been there, learned the language, getting ready to teach here just in the next couple weeks. We pray that you would uh, keep the, the enemy at bay. We know there's always some that would try to discourage or dissuade. And so we do pray that uh, you would allow free course for your word to be taught and clearly understood by those people in their own heart language. And then we trust you with the, how they'll respond to it. Thank you for this time we've had together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.